a uh, very good evening to all our viewers today uh, we have with us um, a very knowledgeable person in the space of investments uh, especially on impact investments he has worked for cooperative bank uh, group for 20 years on uh, ethical policy responsible investments and presently is utilizing friends provident foundations endowment for its goal of sustainable economy we would all like to welcome mr colin baines investment engagement manager at friends provident foundation welcome uh, colin thanks haisha thanks for having us uh, i'm 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 really looking forward to chatting to you and to answering any questions that the iic uh, sr students might have uh, so it's a real pleasure to be here thanks for having me uh, i um, won't talk too long uh so so we've got plenty of time for questions uh but just by way of an introduction uh i'll give a little bit of background on some of the areas of corporate responsibility and sustainability that i've worked in over the years so for about 18 years i've worked in the fields of of ethical and responsible finance corporate social responsibility sustainability policy and eco campaigns and this has been through the co-op bank co-op asset management and the co-op group and for the past 5 years through friends provident foundation and snowball impact management so so much of this has been in finance uh, including esg uh, which stands for environmental social and governance and it's becoming really quite a big issue in the investment field uh, responsible investment ethical investment and impact investing which are all very distinct areas of responsible finance Uh, and this is include policy development and implementation esg research shareholder engagement uh, esg policy compliance and disclosure uh, engaging with asset managers excluding finance and then direct impact investing in the solutions uh, and i've also been involved in advocacy and campaigns primarily around climate change uh, where i've worked with businesses investors and ngos to collaborate to undertake research and policy development uh and to engage governments the market and the public to bring about the change that we need to see uh and over the years my work's focused on a wide variety of issues and like i said it's mostly climate change uh and that includes high carbon financial risk low carbon transition plans energy market disruption and renewables but also other uh corporate responsibility issues such as uh, responsible lobbying and social issues like fair pay and decent work so i i'll leave it there uh, and uh, i'll i'll answer any of the questions that you may have uh, uh so it's a very interesting work that you are doing uh, colin uh, your earliest stint was ethics advisor at coop what did uh, it include and how do you see that the concept of business and ethics have evolved over a period of time well i was responsible for the implementation and development of the co-op banks ethical policy it was quite a pioneering policy back then um it it, it was a it's a customer led policy that states where the bank will and will not invest its money uh so so my role there involved screening hundreds of businesses annually researching a wide range of environmental and social issues and then were necessarily declining millions of pounds of finance to those businesses that breached the policies that we had and those policies covered human rights labor rights um climate change obviously uh, ecological impact uh, and animal welfare as well So for example on climate change we would not provide any finance to any business involved in the extraction and production of fossil fuels and the cooperative bank itself had divested from fossil fuels in 1998 so they were quite ahead of the curve um and a lot of other you know financial institutions have have followed on that path since Uh, I was also responsible for ethical and sustainability policies in other areas of the cooperative group business. Uh so for example in they have a lot of retail stores selling food but also selling electricals and appliances. So one such policy was the introduction of an energy efficiency policy 
for all light bulbs and kitchen appliances that we sold in our stores. This was the first major product range review by a major retailer due to climate change concerns. And in the end, we withdrew 45% of all the products, uh, all the light bulb products and kitchen appliance products that were for sale because they didn't meet that new efficiency standard. And we went as far as banning the old fashioned incandescent light bulbs. And then a few years later, regulation came in and actually did the same thing. So um, that's what we was doing back then. I would say the concept of business ethics is still very much rooted in the same issues. It's, it's very much built on the same foundations of as all those years ago, but it's certainly developed further. So waste is a good example. You know, back then, 18 years ago, the talk was very much about um, reducing use, um, reusing things, and then um, and then recycling them. It was called the the waste hierarchy, but that's somewhat changed now because of um, evolution in science and technology, and our understanding of the problem has got much better than it was eighteen years ago. The emphasis now is on circular economy. So how are those goods designed in the first place? Uh, and can they be designed in such a way that they produce little or no waste, or they dramatically reduce the need for new raw materials? So that's, that's where we are now, whereas we was very much a conversation about recycling, but we're now talking about the root cause of the problem, and that is resource use. So the debate has got much more sophisticated and our under, as our understanding has got better, the whole agenda has moved forwards in a really positive way. That's really encouraging and uh, very good to uh, learn about uh, the evolution, uh, moving just from recycling to actually going to the source of the creation um so that's where the circular economy concepts are coming into picture uh now collins as we move forward do you have also volunteered to be on the board of several cause driven organizations such as stop funding hate and climate change charity possible and to join advisory committees of several universities focusing on sustainability issues now, where do you think we are heading towards as a human race for caring towards environment and what is needed to be done? Well, I try to be positive, but we, we are faced with, you know, really um, uh, huge challenges that we've never experienced before, you know, as, a, as civilizations. Um, so... You know, we are running out of time. We are faced with dangerous levels of climate change if we don't act quickly. The, you know, we do act, need to act quickly to prevent a new mass extinction event in nature. There is extensive damage to the planet from a range of impacts, from plastic waste to air pollution. And then there's also social issues that need to be addressed as well. So rocketing global inequality, systemic racism still exists in a lot of, you know, many societies. Um, but I do take solace that global consciousness of the problems are increasing and that solutions to most of the challenges we face actually do exist. So, for example, on climate change, to reach about 70% of the emissions cuts that we need to by to reach net zero by 2050, and to avoid temperature increases in excess of 1.5 degrees. We could take action now that will get us 70% of the way. We just need the will to make those changes, uh, whether that's in the world of politics or business or you know individual, uh, individual choices and in how we live our lives. So there is solar power, solar and wind power, are both readily available now and very cheap and the, they are the cheapest forms of energy in the world now and then there are 
other solutions coming forward like battery technology like smart technology to um to manage our energy demand so we're we're using the energy when the sun is shining or the wind is blowing um and you know think things like that are there right now so it's just really about the will to do it and we can avoid these absolute catastrophes that are looming ever larger and we've got ever shorter time to actually address them um but like i said you know it, it's not we shouldn't be too doom and gloom about it we can be reasonably positive we just need to keep hammering away at the powers that be whether that's you know if you whether that's your local government or whether it's in your workplace um or if it's just how you live your life in your own home we we can do a lot right now wonderful collins um now uh, you are presently employed as investment engagement manager at friends provident foundation using its charitable um, endowment for fair and sustainable economy what does that involve and also i would like to mention i've been working on a book known as sustainable economy and uh, it's been about a year and a half trying to find ways how we can build sustainable economy so i would like to understand from you what would you really mean and how can we achieve it okay well in my role now in friends provident foundation it is primarily working on the investment side um so i use our influence as an asset owner we have a um an endow and a charitable endowment of several million pounds uh and i i try to leverage that as much as i can to effect change so uh i you so as an asset owner we have asset managers who invest the money for us so i use our influence with them around um you know a uh, responsible investment policy what are the investment practices what's the reporting and disclosure like how do they integrate environmental and social issues into the day-to-day -day investment decisions and how do they engage with the companies that they invest in on on environmental and social issues so that, so that's a big chunk of what i'm doing and a good example of this is um we've just put together what we're calling the cop 26 declaration of asset owner climate expectations um which along with dozens of other asset owners including charitable foundations university endowments pension funds etc we are going to launch this at the copen at the cop 26 climate talks in glasgow next week now as you may have heard over there it's certainly the case here as we approach these climate talks every investment manager will be announcing new climate policies they'll be making claims to climate leadership but how are how are other asset owners politicians journalists civil society how are they to know what is good practice and what is meaningless greenwashing well this declaration sets out to answer that question so it's a set of principles that we expect our investment managers to adhere to as minimum standards and it really is to draw the line on that greenwashing that unfortunately is so common amongst investors and often amongst businesses and we want to send a very clear market signal that that will no longer be tolerated so just to take a couple of examples of of, of the principles there we're calling on every investor to have a presumption to vote in favor of climate change resolutions at the agms of companies they invest in so if there's a if there's a vote to be had that say calls on a company to introduce a low carbon transition plan or it calls on them to uh, exit fossil fuels and to develop green alternatives we expect investors to vote for that automatically that will have a huge impact in the economy if most large mainstream investors started to adopt behaviors like that so they say they are committed to addressing climate change well the first thing you should do 
is you use your votes as a shareholder to achieve that end. And by if, if enough of them start to vote for those resolutions, they will start passing. And then those companies will be legally obliged to do whatever it was that that resolution called for. So that's one example. Another is engagement escalation. Lots of investors say they support the transition to net zero and, to, and they support the Paris Climate Agreement. Um, and they engage with the companies they invest in to try to support that and bring it about. But more, what we see quite often is the practice doesn't meet up with what they are committing to. So we want to see formal engagement escalation policies that says you will engage with this company. If a company doesn't do what you ask it to do or it doesn't respond satisfactory, what will you do next? And we want them to tell us how they will escalate. So, and that will include things like we would expect to see them voting against the re-election of directors. If a company refuses to transition to net zero or to start on that pathway, those directors are not fit to be running those companies. They are basically, you know, they are, they are acting in a dangerous way irresponsible, unsociable way, and they should not be in that position. So we expect them to vote down directors if a company isn't doing what it should be doing in this space. So that's just two examples of what could have a huge impact on the economy if, it, if investors start to use their shareholder influence to bring about the changes that we need to see. I also use our influence as a shareholder directly. So I not, don't necessarily go through the investment managers. I will also engage directly working alone or with others um, to engage companies. And right now we have a program of engagement with the energy utility sector. And we are engaging with them to adopt formal just transition strategies to net zero. Um, successes include, we've got a Scottish utility company called SSE. In November last year, they introduced the world's first formal just transition strategy. And just this week, the British utility company Centrica, which owns British Gas, has just made a similar commitment. And so has the French utility company EDF. Both have pub just published, EDF today in fact, have just published comprehensive just transition strategies. So the just transition is about factoring the social dimension into climate change strategies to ensure the risks to workers, local communities, supply chains and consumers are mitigated and the opportunities for a more just system are pursued. So we want to see things like um, if a company has a fossil fuel power station, we want to see it being closed in a timeline that fits the science, but then to retrain the fossil fuel workers to work in the green economy. Or once that fossil fuel site has been demolished, we would like to see that site reused. Maybe it can be a large solar plant, um, but to create new good quality green jobs in the same areas that uh, the fossil fuel jobs are being lost from. And then there's also to ensure risks in the supply chain are, addre are addressed, such as poor working conditions in electrical component manufacturing or child labour in the sourcing of raw materials. And by, by doing the whole transition in a just way, it will make the transition more resilient. It's much, much more likely to be popular and it's much more likely to happen quickly and smoothly, which is what we really need it to, you know, we, we need it to happen like that now. So by using our influence for a just transition to net zero, we're helping to bring about a fairer and more sustainable economy. And as I've just mentioned, you know, we're not a huge investor ourselves, but we're, we've led a coalition and we've had some real successes that will have it real impacts on both fossil fuel workers, the communities that they're currently operating in, and hopefully supply chains as well. Thank you so much, Colin. And um, I believe in order to realize this, a lot of education is also required. Yeah. 
we play that role and there's a long journey on the same um uh, now collins uh, I, i would also like to invite you to uh, write something on sustainable economy in our book and i'm sure uh, uh, it will be great education document for everybody to uh, read um uh, 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 yeah uh, now collins you have uh, experience dealing with corporates ngos and government you've also executed several projects which project in your eyes could be replicated internationally to solve climate challenges and which stakeholders would you like to invite for the same okay i don't know whether you've heard of the concept community energy that is the ownership and control of renewable energy assets by the communities which host them or at least partially owned by those communities that host them we see that i mean there's no one single magic bullet that's going to address a lot of the challenges the systemic challenges that we face but community energy is a really good one because it brings so many benefits so it's it's renewable energy so it's reducing emissions um it's addressing the climate change challenge but also by <clears throat> by bringing in a community ownership element to it it brings other benefits as well um i see community energy as sat in the middle of a venn diagram which has environment social impact and local economic impact and right in the middle there is community energy and it brings benefits for them all so um here in just just well just up the road here in Scotland there is a there are quite a few community energy projects and they've been assessed to look at how much value they add to the communities they operate in compared to a usual commercially owned um utility owned uh project and it's been found to bring 11 times as much value economic value to those communities because the community ownership um means they are front and center in their mind is benefit for the local community so there are more local jobs more money is kept in the area less is going off to foreign shareholders it's being redistributed or it's being spent for for social benefit in the local community so for things things like we see a lot of reinvestment in local housing stock um to make them more energy efficient uh, and to address fuel poverty these are some of the sorts of examples that that um that community energy brings and then if you look at it from a global perspective there are there are still lots of communities around the world that don't have access to energy don't have access to electricity because of the need at the moment for large grid infrastructure so you'll have a big centralized big expensive centralized energy plant and a large distribution network of very expensive um grid connections but actually community energy at a community scale you don't need any of that infrastructure you could have solar panels maybe a battery and you can very easily bring energy to communities that don't currently have it i see it as being similar in many ways to the revolution in telecoms so whenever mobile phones came along suddenly whole swathes of the globe were connected and had access to telecoms which if you had to rely on telephone wires arriving in your community you could be waiting a very long time and it's the same here you don't have to wait for the electricity grid to arrive in your neighborhood you can pour up some solar panels and you can connect uh you can connect your community and then you can have control over those that renewable energy asset and the benefits from it stay in your area um a, a, a nice example i always use on this is 
a company called Riding Sunbeams that we invested in as part of our impact investing. Riding Sunbeams objective is to power the railways with trackside community owned renewable energy. So when the train's going down a stretch of track, there will be rail, there will be solar panels there owned by the local community, uh, running for their benefit, powering that stretch of railway line. What riding sunbeams does, it acts as the intermediary between the community and the railway company, because the railway company will not want to be engaging with dozens or hundreds of communities to do lots of small projects. Riding Sunbeams does that, and it connects the projects to the railways using technology that it's developed. So we see this is, you know, this is a great example of high impact investments in small and medium sized enterprises that bring a wealth of social and environmental benefits. Riding Sunbeams, incidentally, has just released a report in India that um, it could do the same thing there. Uh, I believe it got a lot of press attention in the last couple of weeks there. Um, it, and, and the report said that um, uh, the, the Indian railways have a target to become the world's first net zero emissions railway by 2030. And the, 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 the business model that Riding Sunbeams has developed could help Indian railways to achieve that whilst also empowering communities all around that railway network. And it could reduce uh, annual emissions by 15 million tonnes of CO2 a year, or 5% of the whole of India's climate target, whilst also bringing these really um, valuable benefits to the communities as well. Uh, that's a very well uh, uh, thought through project. Energy is the next thing that uh, the world is lacking and we are falling short of coal uh, in India. Uh -huh. So I completely agree with you. This is the thing that uh, not only India needs, but uh, also other uh, countries who are falling. Uh, I I've heard that uh, petroleum costs are going high everywhere. So... Yeah. I think so. It's time to... yeah. yeah, I think fossil fuels will get will just become more expensive. And nuclear power will become more expensive, but at the same time, renewable energy is getting cheaper. So why would you invest in something that is going to cost you more when by the time it's finished being built? Whenever there are cheaper alternatives that are safer, cleaner, you know, better for people and better for the planet. I, I totally reckon with uh, what you're saying. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, we look forward to having the change uh, sooner, especially when it comes to even electric vehicles. <clears throat> we do not have uh, electric pumps, you see. That is a um, uh, shortage or that is where we lack the infrastructure. So when we have the charging pumps across in the country that's when i think so we would be more ready to get even tesla in our country great yeah. uh, uh so uh, what is your vision about responsible investments and how do you see uh the coming decade will shape responsible investments well it's a huge growth area more and more investors are claiming to integrate um, environmental, social and governance into their investment decisions. Um, but it needs to be more meaningful. And I mentioned before some of the problems around greenwashing. But I think new standards and market norms will emerge over the next few years. And things like our declaration, COP26 declaration, will help it on its way and to help to drive those those improvements, but so will regulation and legislation. So for example, in the EU, they're about to introduce what is called the EU Green Taxonomy. And that is a guide for investors on what is green and what isn't green investment. So that will help to um, ensure that those investments really are going to climate solutions if that's what the claim that they are making is. Um, 
So I, I, I think we will we will certainly see more global investors claiming to be con- be concerned, and they are they will uh, claim to be part of the solution as opposed to part of the problem. Um, and keeping them honest is going to be is that that will be the challenge, and that's that's going to be something that's bottom up. That's something from from clients, from asset owners like ourselves to say, you're managing our money and we don't want you to do that. We want you to do this. Um, and like I said, putting pressure on governments to legislate as well. Um, so what, what, what's, what's happened in the last couple of years, which is great, is there is a lot more data available and there are more scientific based pathways which investors can follow. So, for example, the International Energy Agency this year launched its 1.5 degrees pathway. And that very clearly states between now and 2050, what sort of activity needs to be stopped and when. So it, it says right now we need to stop investing in new fossil fuel projects and the expansion of fossil fuel projects. They need to stop now. And then over time, uh, so in the first instance, coal needs to be phased out. Then, you know, a bit further down the line, gas needs to be phased out. All energy generation needs to be, um, ne- well, zero carbon by, by the mid-2030s. So there is a pathway there now from a very reputable global uh, institution uh, that both businesses and governments listen to. So I, 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 will, I can see more investors starting to align more of their investment along those sorts of models. Or at the very least, they're going to be put under an enormous amount of pressure to do so. That's, on, that's primarily climate. There is also the S of ESG, the social dimension. That is often ignored. It, or, or it's not as integrated to the same extent as environmental risks are. Um, a lot of social issues are sometimes seen as just a cost. Um, but actually, if you, you know, if you pay workers decently, they spend more, companies and businesses have better profits, investors do better, and it's a virtuous circle. So there are good financial reasons to be t- engaging with companies and using investments to improve the S. Um, now, you know, there have been, there's been the global pandemic has highlighted a lot of issues around uh, things like um, in work conditions, you know, sick pay and things like that. Um, the Black Lives Matter movement has highlighted issues around diversity and inclusion and systemic racism. So these kinds of things have very much put the S of ESG on the agenda and investors are paying attention to it. So I think in the next, over the next decade, we will see more meaningful action in that area, which really hasn't been there to date. Um, that's uh, that's very interesting about the topics you mentioned on the um, human rights aspect. Um, I don't know if I should mention, but lately I was discussing with some of my uh, colleagues who are uh, cribbing about from morning 10 o'clock to night 10 o'clock, they are sitting in front of the computer working and which is true for most of us. Mm. So I think so we should think about uh, human rights in the digital era and uh, (laughs) have uh, some policies in the corporates uh, that a person, a human being cannot work for three hours constantly on the computer. They need 45 minutes, they need a break, uh, which is not being implemented. So I hope... You know, maximum working weeks, uh, maximum working day, regular breaks, um, and even, you know, holidays and maternity leave and things like that they're all essential to they're actually essential to having a good 
efficient and effective workforce. And companies that that I have examined that tr that that treat those issues seriously perform very well. You know, they have lower sickness. Um, you know, people higher morale. And, and, and things like that really do impact on the business side as well and on the efficiency of an organization. So it is in their own interest, really, to take those sorts of issues seriously. It shouldn't be working you to death. Totally, totally. Mm. I appreciate it. Uh, so uh, IACSR is a dedicated institute uh, for training, implementation, and advisory on responsible business leadership. Uh, do you see there is a gap internationally in understanding of the concept of responsible business and uh, which areas should we focus? And um, how do you see that uh, we, got, we can work uh, uh, with uh, your uh, organization to propagate the concepts uh, and the learnings of responsible business leadership? How can uh, we work hand in hand on this? Um, well, I think, I think you know, the first point about business leadership, um, business leaders today in this and today, you know, in this day and age, they need a broad knowledge base on sustainability issues. You know, you, you need to know about this just as much as they need to know about economics say uh or you know um c customer appetite or whatever it might be uh, market demand you know sustainability is now a function of the board so business leaders need to have a reasonable broad understanding of the issues um so you know what are the limitations imposed by climate change how should it affect your energy procurement or um, the design of products around circular economy? You know, whatever it may be, um, these need to be front and center of the of, of the modern business leader sort of thoughts. Also, things like ILO core conventions. Uh, so we, you know, we mentioned human rights and labor rights and the increasing importance of them. So business leaders need to be aware of what are the accepted global minimum standards on these issues. So things like the, you know, the, the, the International Labour Organization is a great example of some very high level principles that every business leader should know. And they should be, they should be confident it doesn't exist in their business or in their supply chain. Uh, and, and similarly around issues around pollution, etc. And, and it, even if not for anything else, that the reputational risk of some of these sustainability issues are huge. Uh, and particularly with the younger generations, that these are very important when it comes to the products you buy, the company you work for, that type of thing. Um, sustainability is of increasing importance. So if you want to attract the brightest and the best, you want to have a loyal customer base, you know, you want to avoid these huge reputational risks if a major you're connected to a major pollution incident or a or a you know a human rights abuse incident or or failure of labor standards, you can do an awful lot of financial damage to a company. So that that's a key reason for it to be on the mind of business leaders. There is a gap in that understanding, unfortunately. Uh, globally, particularly on the, uh, whilst there is increasing acceptance that climate change needs to be addressed. Again, the sort of human rights and labor rights and the S of ESG side of things is often ignored. So th there's, a, there's, a, there's a gap, there's a gap there to address, to, to, to fill that knowledge gap. Um, so yeah, I, I, I would focus myself on, on a very broad base, covering lots of issues, but what are the material things in each? Labour standards, climate change emissions, except, you know, water, um, resource use, that type of thing. Um, now, how, how we work together, well, we, we need to see global cooperation. It's, on, on, you know, that's undoubted. 
and perhaps those institutions that have been um, grappling with these issues for, for decades now to share the learning, to share the barriers they've experienced and, and, and how to get past those barriers and maybe what works well and what doesn't work so well. Sharing that as far and wide as possible is, is, is very important indeed. You don't want somebody, an, an institution that says, right, we want to, we're going to take all of this very seriously and we're going to start doing some work in it to make the same mistakes that others have already made and, and they didn't need to. So that sharing of knowledge is very important. Okay, so I, I do see that there is a scope to work together in this. Yeah. All right. Th uh, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Colin. Uh, we have few comments from our viewers. Uh, Mr. Ankit Kumar, Ms. Uh, Mona Nagarwal, she's appreciating the discussion. And we have a question um, uh, from one of our student masters, uh, student, Mr. Johnny Talreja. I would like to invite you and uh, to uh, please um, ask your question. Yeah, hi. Yeah, thank you so much, sir, for highlighting on COP26 and community energy. And uh, good to hear that because of sustainable economy, we can get some things cheaper as well. So this is interesting. Uh, sir, actually, uh, I have two questions. So uh, since you are an investment engagement manager, so uh, what do you think when you compare two or three companies, what do you think, which are the most widely accepted standards? Like uh, when you report sustainability, you have to follow GRI, IR, and SASB. So what do you think are the most widely accepted uh, principles, uh, reporting principles? Uh, one question is that. And I have another question you want me to ask now, or can I go ahead after that? Yeah, I'll take them both. OK, sure. So sir, another question would be on, do you think data uh, in terms of whether quantifiable data in ESG is a challenge. Now, for example, I will tell you uh, there is as a company A, company B. Company A says, I have then program A, B, C to keep my employees happy. There's a company B which says, I have uh, done this uh, five, six programs to keep my employees happy. Now, both are qualitative information, right? So how do you then compare? I mean, how do you actually know uh, which companies employees are happy so yeah. maybe you as uh, uh, Harsha rightly said you are doing many things many programs but ultimately uh, because of the long working hours employees are not happy so how do you then compare yeah, yeah that's a very good question yeah uh, on the on the first one I mean there's a whole gamut of of uh, reporting standards um, I, I wouldn't say I favor one over the others. It's just important to understand what they contain and what they don't contain. Um, so, so for example, the, the, the declaration that we're making at COP includes one on disclosure and what we want to see. And it's not, um, it's not something that is neatly already inside of a existing um, reporting framework um be, because we we need to see some like commentary on on decision on how on the decision making as an example so if a if a uh, if an investor's doing some engagement we want we would want to see them um in advance say what is the objective of your day of your of your uh engagement what is the timeline for it? Um, how regularly are you going to report against a set of expectations that you have? Um, how are you going to escalate it? Um, these sorts of key questions, while some of them are in, might be in one and, and some of it might be in another reporting framework, as far as I know, there are none that encapture them all, really. Um, it, that's a bit of a challenge, um, but I, I would say on the whole, quite a few of those reporting frameworks are actually quite good. So it's not, it's it's not like 
it's all terrible and you, you know just look at some look for what you want yourself um but I, yeah i wouldn't say there's one that is better than the others on your question of data that's a very good question i hear it a lot particularly on the s of esg on the social issues because you it's there's a lot more data on environmental issues you can say what's your water usage what's your greenhouse gas emissions what's your energy usage how are you going to reduce them and measure them and it's a lot easier it but social issues are so wide for a start so you know from capturing diversity in the workplace to job satisfaction to um good working conditions so you you work in you know is a minimum uh, you're paying a good uh, minimum wage um you know what's your what's your gender pay gap like are you you know is there is there a big gap there for the same job and, and women are being paid a lot less think there's so many issues you can think of. You could probably reel off a hundred. So it's very difficult to condense all of that into one data set. Uh, and I mean, the real trick is to get consistent, comparable information from companies that you can then you can then judge peers against each other. So you need to get it in a reasonably consistent, comparable way. That just doesn't exist right now, unfortunately, but there are initiatives. So I'm a member of an initiative called the Workforce Disclosure Initiative that's that's uh, run by a group called Share Action here in the UK. Mm. And it's engaging hundreds of the world's largest companies to try to get the data out of them in a consistent, comparable way. Now, I think it's going to take years, if I'm perfectly honest, to develop that set. But We've done a framework, we've set the spreadsheet, they've got something to complete every year and hundreds of very large businesses across markets are already doing it. We're not really saying at this point, you've got to do it this way. We're just trying to get them out of him first. Let's get the day, let's get them reporting, let's get them putting some resource into this. And then in time, as it improves, we'll say, right, They've got a great way of this company X has got a great way of reporting this particular social issue. We would suggest everyone else does it in that way. And then we'll we'll start to flesh out the framework. And in time, we will have a set of consistent, comparable data on a very wide range of on, on, on worker issues in that instance to be able to then have those conversations that you're talking about. Um, it's a little bit, I guess where we are now on, on on data and reporting and social issues is a bit like where we were with climate change 10 years ago so the carbon disclosure project was doing this for the, for the environment and for, for for climate 10 years ago and now there's lots of consistent comparable ways to do it so i think hopefully it won't take 10 years but it will take a, it will take a few years thank I you so much yeah. yes sir, sure thank you sir. You're on mute, Marsha. Harsha, you're on mute. Okay, <laughs> sorry. Uh, thank you, Johnny, for uh, asking your question. Uh, Colin, it's a great pleasure to have you on our show and sharing with us the rich knowledge you've gathered over a period of more than two decades um uh, and your generosity to answer uh, all our questions patiently um any final message to all our viewers who are watching this right now or would watch in the coming times uh well i would just say there's no single magic bullet it's going to take a diversity of tactics to achieve sustainability and responsible business uh, and different businesses will 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 approach it in different ways, but I would just say, good luck and thank you. Uh, entering the world of corporate responsibility and sustainability is, you know, you, you're doing a very good thing by doing so. Uh, and whatever sort of business um, you end up in, I mean, you don't even necessarily have to be working in the field of sustainability within a business 
to be able to impact how it conducts itself and how sustainable it is. Um, it is vitally important we take action in the workplace and in our communities um, to, you know, avert some of these disasters that unfortunately are bearing down on us. But I would just say good luck and, uh, and thank you for doing this work. Thank you so much, Colin, for joining us. Uh, really appreciate it. We wish you all the best in all your future endeavors and looking forward to working together. Thank you. Great. You're very welcome. Thank you.